There we go. All right. But you see a drop in operations research analysts. Um, so, but overall, you still see that same kind of disparity in, in occupations, right? Some careers that are seen as more technical have less weapon, women representation. Some careers that are seen as less technical don't see that uh, same. Um, <clears throat> We're starting to see here an increase in uh, women's names on, on patents. Um, and we're starting to see uh, closer to parity between women and men's um, salaries. The, and as the subtitle says here, a uh, big part of that is because there's high competition. If you can find someone, it doesn't matter if they're a man or woman, you want to pay them and get the job done. And so you're not going to um, have a lot of, of difference there. Um, so, so this is the update in 2020. So you see there is some positive sign growth in patents. Um, maybe some growth in, in teaching definitely growth in computer science degrees. But a lot of things that we talked about from the 2016 um, data has not really changed that much. Um, uh, what I don't know is how this year has, has changed things. One of the things that is been true about our response to the coronavirus as a country is that more women have lost jobs than men. Um, and I don't know if that's true in our industry or not, or if it um, if it's an artifact of the types of jobs um, that women tend to be more represented in um, are the types of jobs that are more um, vulnerable to the, the virus. Um, I know that the latter is true. Um, I just don't know if, uh, if that has, if that tells the whole story. A lot of what I understand is that, you know, um, that it's affected women in a lot of disciplines and they just decided to, to stop working to take care of the household like we talked about the, that it, um, it falls disproportionately on them um, and so working from home has been that much more stressful and not seen as worth it in a lot of industries um, okay so I can close this I'm not going to put up any more um, I'm not going to put up any more slides, so I'm done slide sharing. Um, so as we begin discussion, now we kind of have those numbers. We have the, the video that we watched last week, as well as the memo from the Googler. Um, I'd like to just spend some time making this more of a discussion rather than me continuing as a, a monologue. Um, but I want to uh, set uh, uh, ground rules. Um, and that is, since there are more guys in here than, than girls, um, I do not want the guys to ask anyone in here um, to somehow represent their their gender. Okay, so um, 
whether it's Ariel or, <coughs> excuse me, um, Maddie. <sighs> Why am I blanking on your name today? Daisy. No, it's, uh, I'm sorry. It's fine. Or Daisy. When they speak, they're speaking for themselves. They're speaking of any experiences that they want to share. They're speaking of uh, what what they do, and they speak to the extent that they feel comfortable. But they, uh, I, I want to give them permission to not feel like somehow they are speaking for all of womankind. That's not fair for us to do that to them. That somehow what they feel or what they've experienced um, somehow represents all of, 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 of women. Okay, so um, I do not want I do not want them to feel that pressure. I don't want them to feel pressure that they even have to share. Um, they they can share as much or as little as as they want to. Um, it's easier for us as guys to not feel that pressure because there's more of us, and so obviously they, when we're speaking and there's ten other people in the room, it's it's much more clear that that's not the case. Um, the other thing, and and I don't have stats for this um, because it's a lot harder to find in technology is I don't want this just to be about uh, representation of women in the technology field, but I think it should be more generally um, discussed that we're, we're wanting to talk about underrepresentation, especially this year as, as we, we've seen um, discussion about Black Lives Matter and how um, there's not an equitable representation uh, or uh, systemic uh, racism that occurs throughout our country. I don't think our discipline is immune to those um, cultural factors, those choices that have been made. Um, and um, I think um, more broadly, we should be thinking about this as how do we bring in all people from all walks of life and, and become widely representative of society as a whole and not a monoculture mono and not homogenous? I very strongly feel that way. Um, but um, I'm, I know from having conversations that not everyone agrees with me. Um, and so I would like to open up the floor now for the next 40 minutes we get a discussion about how important you think this is or why you think this is overblown, um, why, um, how you think we can do a better job of this, what, um, et cetera. I'd just like to start to hear some of the feedback um, that, that you guys have about this topic. Yeah, Shane. Uh, I guess I just have a question. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking a lot about um, during the, uh, the movie and then also when we were reading through the, the, uh, the book 
support what we put out. Um, good Google, um, an ideological chamber. Uh -huh. um, was how they would always start at the premise um, that there is inherently an issue um, anywhere where there is unequal representation. Uh -huh. And so um, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, get your, your thoughts on why you think that um, there's necessarily a moral issue if there is an equal representation of everything. All right. I will let others speak before I respond, if anyone wishes to. I'm just add a bit of the same question, or just over and over in the movie, they can say, like, oh, we're underrepresented. I say, like, okay, what's, what is inherently the problem with all of this in general? And it was like all sorts of arguments you make, of like, oh, this could be why, this could be why, this could be why. Uh -huh. It's just like, they're like no, underrepresentation, there are problems. Like, okay, how did we get to the Okay. So that is also my question. I mean, the way that I interpreted the issue is that the top of representation matters, great equal representation matters, is not backed up by the ability to retain that representation. So, what you were saying earlier about why a workplace in tech is more hostile overall to women than men does not back up the top that we want equal representation. So, just because a woman can get a job. Equally as the equal chances of men is not being that the retention rate is the same as the environment is the same. So that to me is if there if there's an equal ability between men and women to represent themselves in the workforce, that's one thing, but then maintaining that is another issue. And if you're not actively working to maintain that equal representation, then I think that is the issue. Or at least the ability to have that representation. Yeah, Daisy. I would say for me that, like, to me, representation is not I walk in a company and there are half of the people there that look like me. I don't think that for me personally that. I need 50% women in order to feel like welcome, safe, whatever you have it. But I do feel like I have the need to want to walk in a company and not feel like for minute one I have to prove myself to be equal with the men. And like for the stigma to kind of go away, because like, you know, social media and stuff has kind of blown up in the past five years. So I thought that maybe some of the issues that we were seeing are maybe kind of old and outdated. But I was talking to Dr. Stanley and he just had a prospective student come in that said that. She didn't take programming classes in her high school because her advisor and other people around her told her that that was a boy class and she shouldn't take it. And in 2020, to still have that is just shocking to me at this point. I'm not looking carefully at the Zoom meeting, so Ariel or just Jeremiah, if you want to participate, just speak up. Uh, sure. I just say, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I'll just say it real fast. I think that, like, it doesn't have to be like an inherent issue that there's unequal representation between women and men. Like, I'm kind of with Daisy on that, but I do think that we should ask ourselves why, and I think that there might be, there might be some problems within that why that we'll find. And I do think that, like, the the movie and like some of the stats that we looked at today, like. Point is to places where there might be problems. I think to, to answer your question for myself, Shane, uh, and Joe, the reason why to me it's a moral imperative is because I do not believe that there is a fundamental disparity between men and women's ability to do computer science. And so if there's not, a, if, because I don't believe that, then, then I believe that um, we, are, we are setting up societal norms, like Daisy mentioned, where people just tell girls that they don't belong. That's not where girls belong. 
um, or um, we uh, we put up stereotypes like the 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 pink and I can speak to this having four daughters. There is such a difference between the the boys' toy aisle and the girls' toy aisle. It's not even it, it funny. Um, and to the point where my third daughter, who likes to play with the kind of toys that you probably like to play with, things that are more constructive in, in nature or cars and trucks or things, calls her toys boy toys. Right? She has ascribed gender to them uh, because she associates them with boys and not with girls. So um, I, because I don't think there's an inherent ability of women to different from men in computer science, and we're constructing up these kind of barriers, I think uh, we are inevitably preventing some of those women from doing what they, what God has best created them to do, what if God is, would um, design them to to be best at participating in our society at large at wit. And to me, that is a moral wrong doing to put those barriers in front of people from being able to do what they would be, what they're most created to do. Um, if I somehow thought that there were, was an inherent difference between men and women in computer science, then I would have to examine it differently. Um, I would have to examine, well, given those differences, then does that better explain why their results in such a disparity? And, and I, I, I think that's true, like I said, I, I, I think that's also true of African Americans, of Hispanics, of Asians, um, and, and many other underrepresented minorities. I don't think there's an inherent, they cannot participate in our community. There, there's not the intellectual capability or the way of thinking or reasoning that prevents them from uh, participating. And so that's why I think it's a moral imperative to uh, allow them to participate in, in the field they're best designed to participate in. There's another point I would like to add to the discussion that even assuming that women and men are, have equal programming ability and equal desire to go into programming and everything was being equal and all of the treatment the men and received were equal, there's a chance we still wouldn't see exactly equal representation specifically because there are fields that have higher female representation, like in social work, or I could probably find any number of other examples mm -hmm. by using time research online. But because men are underrepresented in those fields, that means they would be going into other more quote unquote masculine fields. And so even if everything else was equal, you would still expect to see a higher male representation just because of quantity. Well, because yes, I think, I think you have equal male and female in your population you cannot have male dominated fields without also having female dominated fields. Right. And I think the 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 implied thing is that, you know, those probably should swing the other way. Um, but I can't address those other fields as effectively as I can address the field that I'm that I'm in. Okay. If I may add another point, I think there is a model 
a lot of us use when looking at women in tech fields like this. And that is that we look at that bell curve that was in the Google report, and we say that, oh, on average, women are probably less good at computer science than men are. And so anytime we run into a random man or a random woman in the field, you just kind of have this kind of fle very flexible stereotype on them, saying that they are probably either better or worse at it. And I do want to emphasize that that stereotype is very flexible, because that's a lot of how we deal with ideas like sexism or just gender disparities. We make our stereotypes flexible. And so it, when we encounter somebody in this workplace, we want to give them the freedom to prove themselves, to say, hey, I am actually good at this. And in that case, they kind of jump up the line a little bit. And so then they're up across the line. They're among the good people now, the world of people who are good at this now. And so we don't have a problem. And that's the model that a lot of us use. But I think that model does kind of have a problem with it. Because line jumping takes effort on the woman's part. She has to specifically overcome that kind of setback that she started out with. And so, yeah. And of course, anytime she makes a mistake or has to ask for help, as we all do, she runs the risk of falling back in that line in the minds of a whole bunch of people who are busy trying to figure out where exactly she fits on those twin bell curves. And of course, it's even if I, for instance, am one of those brilliant people who never allows her to slip back down again, she has to do that line jumping process over and over again for pretty much every new person she meets in the industry. And as they said in the video, Having to do that all the time, day after day, adds a lot of, it's exhausting. It adds a lot of extra bandwidth, a lot of extra effort that the average woman has to put in in order to make it in this field. And so I feel like the minimum standard for the amount of effort required to get ahead in this field is actually higher for women than for men. And I would. Add that with another point about the idea of inherently the better programming skill, those twin bell curves. I want to draw attention back to those. And let's just imagine for a moment that we live in a world where we can't possibly know if men are actually better than women at this. There are people who say we are, there are people who say we aren't. Let's just pretend for a moment that we can't know. And so I ask you, Doing a simple cost-benefit analysis, which philosophy holds greater risk? Is it, would you rather they be able to get into computer science, but we assume they can't, or would you rather that they can't get into computer science, but we assume they can? Because basic psychology says if you think you can do something, you'll be more likely to actually get into it. And so I feel like if we can't know, it is probably better to assume they are equal just because that kind of philosophy is more helpful, I think. That's just me. I think an important question to also wrestle with is what, how this actually affects you personally. Okay, um, if you're if you're a guy and you haven't been um, 
subjected to these um, having to prove yourself. Is this just a theoretical di discussion, or is there is there a pragmatic response that you can participate in? I think this is maybe the most important question you can ask yourself because if you, the reality is, it's very clear from the numbers we looked at that most of the companies that you will enter will have more men in them than women. So we are in that, the position of being in that unbalanced situation. Regardless of if it's a moral right or more wrong, that is a, a fact. Um, and so if uh, if you're in that position and one of the biggest things from, I don't even want to say one of these. One of the um, contributing factors to that is that more women leave the workplace than, than men because of bad workplace experiences. <clears throat> How can you be a, an effective um, member of, of the team that you're participating in um, to, at a minimum, keep the employees there who should be there and maybe as a as a more proactive measure, try to increase the representation of women in, in your company. What kinds of things can you proactively do? Um, I think my, my opinion on this matter um, sort of sort of stems from this this uh, uh, from the, the topic of the equality. Uh -huh. um, and so there there are multiple perspectives that we could have to achieve equality, and uh, one of them would be uh, classically one of them would be equality of opportunity. And the other being uh, equality of outcome. And so, um, specifically, when we were talking about um, how how we should approach proactively um, uh, increasing the representation of women in STEM fields, mm -hmm. um, I feel like when we get into uh, language like that. We, we sort of uh, slide more into the field or the, the school of thought that, that we more favor equality of outcome over equality of opportunity. Does, it, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. And I'm, I'm willing to change my language to continue to promote an equality of opportunity. Okay. Um, I think 
I think that right now the outcomes are so skewed that uh, it's clear that there isn't any quality of opportunity. Um, so, so I think that, uh, so, so stepping back a little bit, um, at, when I personally approach, um, like this topic, um, I think my opinion is, is sort of along these lines, um, like, of course, so, um, I'm, for those who don't know, I'm computer engineering. And currently, we're working on um, it, our senior engineering project, right? and um, I'm working with like there's obviously some female engineering majors as well. And um, my, I guess my personal experience is, I mean, take it for what it's worth, is that they're uh, just as competent, um, honestly. Not more in some cases, but it's you know, probably I don't know. I don't want to say anything. But uh, um, basically, I don't see them as really being uh, very. Uh, I, I don't see their their capabilities as being any different from from men. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, I would say that that's honestly reflected in most if not all other areas of life. But um, because of that, I, would, I personally, um, I kind of, I guess I, I hold the perspective of like, uh, kind of like what Cordell was saying that, like assuming, yeah, like you, you're just as capable as any, any guy would be. Um, and, Realistically, if, if I, I haven't really run into this before, but if, if I um, experienced any any like men, for example, um, that would push back and, and say otherwise, um, I would definitely uh, disagree and voice my opinion and and uh, I guess try to to confront the the, the man or, or man who, who said that. Um, but I I think it's I think it's I, I guess what I'm coming at it I guess what I'm coming from is saying like uh, if you if you were to like if you were to say to me like hey look at that that's a that's a blatant example of uh, of sexism that exists um, in the workplace or that's this is a an example of sexism that exists in a society or, or just as a social construct. I would definitely stand uh, with anyone and oppose that. Um, but I think it's I think it's difficult to um, point to uh, like society or like the, the world as a whole and and make statistics um, and not ne not necessarily that these are like not necessarily that I can look at these graphs and go, like, oh, like what's what's going on. Um, but, but what I'm saying is, I, I think it's we, we're we're pointing to a, an incredibly complex system and saying that okay, like somewhere in here, there's some things that are causing this great divide, um, and we have to fix it. Um, and sure, that may be the case, and, and I'll stand I'll stand with anyone who would. Uh, I guess point me to to anything saying otherwise, but um, I, I think there. Are, I think you could definitely make a case that there is. Um, if, if we're working towards the quality of um, of opportunity, I'm I'm fully there, and I think we um, have that. But as soon as we start to to Pursue like equal representation of, of every subsect of society in, in every area of life. I think that's where we um, kind of have to take uh, two extreme measures and, and try to enforce uh, methods of, of carrying out life that uh, would ensure quality of, of outcome.
I know that was kind of a lot. So let me make sure I was hearing you correctly. Um, I, I hear you saying that you're worried because it the language being used sounds like it is focusing on um, trying to ensure um, equal numbers. And in order to accomplish that, the mechanisms necessary to do that uh, go beyond providing the equality of opportunity. And um, yeah, I, I think that's what I'm saying. And then um, sort of along that, along those lines, uh, that so when we when we try to enforce methods uh, providing equality of outcome, I feel like there at least has to. Um, and this was something that was even uh, discussed a little bit. Um, in the, the Google manifesto, uh, but it was, it was talking about how um, when we when we do things like when we do things like that, we then get into uh, territory territory that's enforcing like unfair standards on uh, uh, across like different applicants. I have to provide a concrete example to try to break down what you're saying. So like if a guy and a girl were applying for the same job and they had the same skill. And this company was someone who was saying, we want equal representation. Mm -hmm. And they didn't clarify whether that was equal opportunity or equal outcome. We were worried that the temptation for that company would be to hire the woman just because they want equal numbers and not and make that decision off of that factor instead of the fact that they both should have equal opportunity in this job. Well, sure, and that's, that's already in place in um, in other areas of life as well. Um, a, a, common, a, a common example of this is in higher education, for example, there's, um, uh, this is specifically what happened to do with uh, representation of uh, different races. Um, but it's affirmative, affirmative action. action. So um, affirmative action, there was actually a big lawsuit that just happened with Harvard. Um, where there were these Asian students who they tried to get into Harvard and so pretty much these students who applied like five point oh GPA, play like five instruments, play like ten sports, you know, like the, the perfect human specimen, um, and got like a perfect score on the SAT, everything, and they got uh, they got uh, like denied. Uh, they, they weren't allowed to, they weren't accepted to go to Harvard. And so uh, basically um, they sued and, and they won because effectively the, the, the sole reason why they weren't accepted into Harvard and why other minority groups who were, who were not as equally represented were not as equally represented um, were at, at lower standards. Uh, it was solely because there's already a, a high percentage of Asian students uh, who, who attend Harvard. And so um, I, I think I think that it's, it would be very easy to uh, be pursuing this with with you know good intentions. Uh, but to also slide into this uh, this uh, way of thinking that is trying to ensure um, equality of outcome 